Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, that's me. Welcome. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to get a coffee, cup of tea, and to dry off. It is dismal out there this afternoon. So hopefully we can come in, spend some time together, um, and we're going to have a fantastic lecture from Matthew. So you're all very welcome. It's lovely to be back um, here at Bayes Business School um, and for the Robert Oakshot lecture. Um, a bit of housekeeping first, so there are no planned fire alarms. So if you, anything were to happen, please exit outside, uh, either side there, and then there are fire exits marked uh, in, the, in the area where we've just been having teas and coffees. Um, so I'd like to start by saying some thank yous. Um, these events are always put on thanks to the generous support of others. So firstly, I'd like to say thank you to our host, Bayes Business School, um, but also to Brabners, who kindly sponsored this year's event. Um, Matthew, thank you too for giving your time. Um, we're going to have the chance for a Q&A later, so I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities there. Um, and thanks to the friends and family who've joined us today. Um, Robert's family, I'm sure. Uh, continue, oh, big whoop from the back there. Uh, it's really lovely to have you here with us. Um, now, I didn't really have the fortune to meet Robert, and so I've done the next best thing and tried to learn a little bit about him um, through reading a fantastic autobiography, Kevin Shillington's autobiography. Some of you have made picked up copies of that last year, but also speaking to friends and family. And the thing that really shone through for me is that Robert was a pioneer, a maverick, I think, in many ways. Um, and he was a man who knew how to live life to its fullest. Um, it seems that Robert made friends everywhere he went, from Botswana to Zambia, Hungary, uh, to Sunderland. Um, and it, doing so, he, he really tried to utilise his skills, his warmth, his humour, his energy, his innovation um, to put power to people. And I think what, the fact that we're here today as the EOA is testament to that. Um, I'm going to hand over shortly to, to Ma our, our guest speaker today, Matthew Taylor. Um, but before we do, I'd really like just to give a couple of opportunities to our hosts and to our sponsors to say a few words. And then after Matthew's speaking, I'll be coming back on the stage um, and chairing a Q&A. So as Matthew speaks, please uh, do think of any questions you might want to pose about the content that we're putting forward today. Um, and I think Matthew said you can be as, um, as provocative as you like. So I think there's an invitation. Um, so without further ado, because I really want to get to the main event, I'm going to introduce um, AJ Baller, who is the uh, Professor of Family Business and Innovation here at Bayes Business School. Thanks very much, AJ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I remember 2012 when we had this, I think if I'm not mistaken, the first uh, Robert Oakeshott lecture. And a year before that, I had the opportunity to 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 meet and shake hands uh, with Robert Oakeshott. So, uh, you know, it's a real privilege and honor, I think, for us to host this uh, at BASE. Uh, we are, I, I think, been very fortunate. Uh, my team, um, uh, Joseph Lample, uh, Pushkar Jha, Anish Banerjee, all of us have been working uh, with the Simple Remit uh, since 2009 uh, to provide an evidence base for how employee ownership or greater employee ownership makes a difference. And I remember um, receiving the first call to be invited to pitch for the work in 2009 for employee ownership and uh, looking at how it makes difference. And we uh, were fortunate enough to have the evidence base, provided the evidence base for, uh, you know, Natal review later on. Uh, to, to look at uh, the, uh, the impact of employee ownership in Britain. And really the, the highlight was that when times are tough, especially during 2009 financial crisis, how employee-owned firms did better than non-employee-owned firms. Uh, later on uh, in 2012, 2014, 2017, we've done more work on the ownership effect inquiry, and my colleague, especially uh, Anish Banerjee, was involved in uh, laying the framework, helping lay the framework for ownership effect inquiry. And uh, we really, really honored, I think, privileged to work with uh, with the ecosystem here, and also with other institutions which uh, which have joined hands, whether it is Oxford, York. Northumbria ownership at work. So really, really happy and joyful to have you here, all of you. And without further ado, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, invite the next next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this year's Robert Oakshot Lecture, hosted by the Employee Ownership Association. I'm Mered Platt. I'm a senior associate at Brabner's, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here once again and to be sponsoring for a second year in a row. For those of you who don't know Brabner's, we're a leading independent law firm with offices in Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester and Preston, hence the broad Lancashire accent. Um, we achieved B Corp status just under 18 months ago and we strongly believe that business has a responsibility to um, uh, provide a positive impact and a lasting change. Our approach to doing better business um, aligns with our sustainability strategies and um, that goes much further than the environment alone. Being a responsible business, we're committed to making a positive impact to our clients, our people and the communities we serve. We work closely with the EOA and having specialist advisor status, we're proud to be uh, leading advocates and advisors in employee ownership and responsible business. The EOA are the key voice to the employee sector and the, um, they help businesses in exploring and progressing employee ownership. And together we um, promote the sector and, and support businesses throughout and beyond the employee ownership journey. But enough about us. I'm sure you're all keen to hear from the guest speaker, Matthew Taylor. Matthew joined the NHS Confederation as its chief exec in June 2021. And prior to that, he was the chief exec for the Royal Society for Arts, Manufacturers and Com Commerce for 15 years. Having led the independent review into modern working practices, Matthew was instrumental in developing proposals um, to improve mod um, employment practices and good quality work for all. I think it's becoming more and more important to businesses um, in their sustainability strategies and social responsibility strategies um, to the, ensuring that the responsible business and employee engagement um, is key in, in those strategies. Employee ownership is part of that, of course. Um, I think any business that ad already adapts a sustainable business model um, are keen to learn more about employee ownership um, as it fits in with the future of their business and their employees. Um, and employee ownership continues to challenge the traditional ways of doing business. So I'll hand over shortly to, to Matthew uh, to speak more about his um, Good Work report. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend you do so. Um, it covers key topics um, in relation to quality of work, the evolution of the labour market, responsible business and embedding lasting change. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Mairead, um, Bessa, uh, James, it's, um, oh, I haven't got, um, you know, well, ruined my opening. Um, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, if I'd known this event was sponsored by a dynamic and successful law firm, uh, I'd have asked for a fee. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry if I look a bit damp, by the way. Um, I, I, I got to walk, as many of you would have done, walked through the rain. Um, but then I guess... I guess if there's if there's one event um, uh, where you don't really need to worry about sartorial elegance, uh, it's an event uh, in tribute to Rob Oakshot, because uh, as I understand it, if I really wanted to live up to Robert's standards, I'd probably be wearing my gardening trousers and a pair of Wellington boots or whatever. So um, uh, I don't have to apologize. Although if any of you do uh, want to criticize me for the fact I'm not wearing a tie or a suit, I will be triggered by that. Um, uh, people sometimes ask me, because I've been in and around politics most of my life, why I'm not a politician. And I trace it all back to uh, a time many, many years ago when I was actually a county councillor. So I, I was an elected politician once. Um, and uh, it was at a public meeting we were having in Stratford-upon-Avon. I was part of a minority Labour administration in Warwickshire. Um, uh, and we were elected for the previous 97 years, the Conservatives are on Warwickshire. So our, our campaign slogan was end 97 years of Tory misrule. Um, 
Anyway, we had a, a manifesto commitment to abolishing selective education. Now, it was completely ludicrous because the Liberal Democrats weren't going to support it and the government wasn't going to support it. But these were the 1980s and it was in our manifesto. So we just had to kind of do it. So we went to this meeting in Stratford-upon-Avon and there were hundreds of, of, of rather posh parents. And I was this kind of young councillor and uh, I was the subject of quite a lot of vitriol. Anyway, at the end of the public meeting, this gentleman walked up to me and he said to me, you know, it's an absolute disgrace. Uh, and, and I said, oh, well, <laughs> what exactly? And he said, well, you. He said, and, and he said, what you're wearing. He said, it's appalling. Uh, and I, I, I thought I was wearing jeans and a jacket. I said, well, I said, look, I, I, I don't see why this is so bad. I said, look, I'm, a, I'm you know, I'm, I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just wearing ordinary clothes. You know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm an ordinary person. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, yes. He said, I'm rather afraid you are. Uh, <laughs> and I... I've never really recovered from that, really. I just, um, so, um, uh, it, it's great to be here, and um, I'm very grateful uh, for being asked to do it for a number uh, of reasons to, 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 to this lecture, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is just an enormous relief not to have to think about the state of the NHS uh, just for a few days. Um, it's been like a little intellectual holiday uh, working on this uh, lecture. Uh, secondly, the lecture prompted me to read Kevin Shillington's lively biography of Robert Oakeshott and find out a little more about this fascinating, innovative, profoundly ethical uh, man. And, and third, I also got to update myself on the slow and steady rise of employee ownership in the UK and also to remind myself of the case uh, for employee ownership in relation to staff well-being and business success. So it's been a, a great process for me uh, preparing this lecture. A few years ago, in the wake of that report um, that Mary kindly referred to that I did for Theresa May, do you remember her? You know, a few, I don't know how many prime ministers ago that is now, but um, I, I wrote a book called Do We Have to Work? which is still available from online bookstores. Um, uh, in that book, I explored the future of work and good work. And actually, uh, in that book, that short book, I did make the case for employee ownership and other kind of mutual and cooperative models. And for me, that case rests on two fundamental problems with the predominant master and servant model of employment. Um, the first is the labor value argument. Uh, that the owners and agents of capital, often for reasons more to do with privilege and luck than effort or skill, do exploit workers by taking as profit the surplus value of their labor. Secondly, the argument made eloquently by American philosopher Elizabeth Anderson in her important book, Private Government, namely that workers give their bosses the kind of power and authority over their lives that we are required to give elected governments, but that unlike government, we have no right to challenge or remove that authority. So you'll be relieved to hear, or most of you will, I suspect, that I'm not a Marxist, nor am I an anarchist, as the rest of this lecture will make clear, nor do I think that employee ownership is the only way to address the problems of the traditional employment model. But the inherent nature of that model means that I strongly favor the growth of alternatives like employee ownership. If, for example, 10% of British workers were employee owners, not only would that choice be available to many more employers and employees, but the example it would set would surely help expose and delegitimize the uglier and rougher edges of what happens in the rest of the economy. Um, I was reminded of this, uh, uh, reinforced in this argument, actually last night, I appear on an obscure radio for a program called Moral Maze, um, which people simultaneously love and are profoundly irritated by. Um, uh, that is to say the small group of people who ever listened to it. Anyway, last night we were talking about veganism. And what was interesting to me, I was defending veganism as a benign social movement. And what was interesting in the conversation was that um, the people arguing against veganism had to say that they were really deeply opposed to factory farming in order to legitimize their position. 
And I thought that was kind of interesting. It's the same point in a way. You need idealists. You need different ways of doing things, not just for themselves, but because of the effect they have on everybody else saying, well, actually, we need, in the face of that, we need to show that our model doesn't have to be exploitational or cruel uh, or whatever. So I'm hugely in favor of a growth of employee ownership. And you know, wouldn't it be great to see that as something which might be championed by an incoming uh, government? But it's not the ideas in that book about work that I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk uh, today. It's, it's an idea in another volume, as yet unpublished, although I'm open to offers. Um, uh, and that's a, a book that I've written really for myself, which reflects, I guess, 30 years of thinking about change and about leadership, thinking about policy, why policy fails, why governments fail, why two thirds of organizational strategies fail. So change is hard, change involving human beings is hard. And so these other ideas I want to share with you are about, about why is change difficult and how might we think differently um, about it. I'm gonna share with you a way of thinking about human motivation. Now in essence, it's a simple model based on a kind of combination of intuition, I'm gonna to try to convince you that you actually all accept these ideas, um, and insights from various schools of psychology and other social uh, sciences. It is a very simple model, but one that I think from which we can develop a richer and more nuanced way of thinking about what makes for dynamic organizations, successful policies, and broader social progress. Now, if you're wondering whether it's reasonable for me to be using this, the Oakshot, lecture to share these ideas, I can assure you as a kind of spoiler alert that um, they also justify two conclusions about employee ownership. So the, the arguments I'm going to share with you uh, lead, I think, to two important conclusions. The first is that employee ownership has substantial advantages as a business model in relation to human motivation and in relation to dynamism and change. But second, that whilst employee ownership is a strong foundation for productivity, worker well-being, there are very important reasons why it's not enough to guarantee uh, success. So, let me turn. Let me. I should have got flat water, shouldn't I? But anyway, um, uh, let me turn to to these arguments. So. Um, you might think, because I'm talking about human motivation, social change, organizational change, that this is going to be a lot of, kind of high conceptual stuff. And there are some concepts here, but actually I want to start with you. I want to start with all of you. And I want to suggest to you that today, everything you did was the result of three core sets of motivations. So a lot of what you did was about following rules, following authority. You know, you obey the law. You're, you're sitting there silently uh, because that's the kind of assumption of the, the rules that govern this event. You know, if you heard the weather forecast, you might have taken, been wiser than me and taken an umbrella with you. So you, you listen to experts, you follow rules, you, you are motivated by authority an awful lot of the time. A second set of things that motivates you is you're motivated by a sense of values based upon the kind of person you feel yourself to be, the kind of tribe that you feel yourself to belong to of people who share values like you. And so that will shape how you treat your family. It will maybe have led you to uh, open the door for somebody who needed it to happen, uh, uh, to stand up for someone on the tube, to ask someone at work about how they're feeling. It might shape your religious or political views. So the second thing that motivates you is that sense of belonging, of values, of, of the tribe you are. And then the third thing that's motivated you today, and it motivated you when you chose your coffee on the way into work, or it motivated you when you picked your holiday destination, or it motivated you when you went to work and worked hard because you want to succeed, is you're motivated by what you want. Not because you're selfish, but just because a lot of the time, what leads us to do what we do is because we choose to do it. So that's nearly, you know, we'll talk about this in questions, but I'd like to suggest to you that everything you've done today so far has been driven by one of those three motivations or by some kind of combination of them, perhaps. There is a fourth and slightly different motivation, which I don't really have time to talk about today, although I'm fascinated by it, which is fatalism. So a lot of the time, we're actually not motivated by anything at all. We kind of just sit on the sofa and we can't be bothered. 
Um, but when you are doing things, it's because of one of those three things. Now, that's a really simple idea, isn't it? Uh, but actually, if you delve into the literature, what you'll find is that those, those three forces recur in all sorts of theoretical models. So if you take, for example, uh, positive psychology is based, which is you know, the dominant school in applied psychology, um, based on a lot of it's based on a theory called self-determination theory. Now, self-determination theory says human beings have got three core motivations, and those three core motivations are defined as mastery. And mastery is what you get generally from kind of going up a hierarchy of expertise and development. That's the kind of following the rules kind of thing. I follow the rules, become better and better at something, I can master it. The second is connectedness, which is that kind of belonging and values, tribal kind of feeling. And then the third is autonomy, which is the individual choice model. So that's the bedrock of most applied psychology is that view of us. And then, of course, I'm going to mention somebody who's not very fashionable anymore, partly because many of his ideas have been discredited. But yet his core idea about the human psyche, I think, still holds true. And that's Freud. And of course, Freud talked about um, our... Uh, our, our psyche being constructed of three elements of the id, which is the kind of appetites and desires, individualistic urge, I'd argue, the superego, which is the kind of conscience, uh, values, uh, belonging drive, and then ego, which is this kind of the, the bit in the middle, the kind of thinking bit, as it were, the rational bit. That Now, what's really interesting about Freud, and I'll come back to this as a talk, is that for Freud, the ego is, on the one hand, it's trying to, a lot of the time, it's trying to deal with the inherent conflict between id and superego, the inherent conflict between what drives our kind of individual appetites and desires and our sense of what we ought to do, our sense of belonging, our sense of, 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 of our responsibility to, to others. And the ego is, 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 is trying to deal with that. And the other thing that Freud said that I think is true, and I think positive psychology fails to grapple with is that actually different parts of our psyche are continually at war with each other, which is why it's quite hard to be a human, with lots of reasons why it's hard to be a human being. But that's probably one of the, one of the reasons it's hard to be a human being is because different parts of our, our psyche want different kinds of things. And that leads us to face all sorts of, all sorts of dilemmas. So I, I want to argue that these motivations are both in all of us and also they're all around us. They shape the social world that exists. Um, around us. But what I've done with these ideas, or in a sense what these ideas have done to me, because I've looked at the way organizations work and I've looked at policy and social change, is that I've thought about them as ways of which we do things together. Because these three ideas that I'm going to refer to now as individualism, solidarity, and hierarchy, so those three drives, that they are all in a sense, a set of ideas about the best ways in which we do things together as human beings. So the hierarchical argument is, well, the best way for human beings to do things is through systems of authority, through strategy, through expertise. And by the way, as you listen to this, imagine being in a conversation in a board meeting or being in a conversation about a policy, and imagine the voices that you would hear in that. You might hear in that conversation where people are saying, what's going wrong in this company? What do we need to do with this policy? Somebody says, what we need is a new strategy. You know, we need KPMG or PwC or one of the other. We need them to come in and we need, you know, a PowerPoint presentation, expertise and leadership and that's kind of sort of. But then another voice might jump up and say, no, actually, that's not really the problem. The problem in this organization is that we've lost our way, that we don't. We're not clear what our values are, that, that people feel this is an unfair organization. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to renew our sense of common purpose. We need a process of really engaging the staff very richly. I mean, I'm in the health service and, you know, people often kind of say this is the fundamental challenge is how do we engage our staff, make them feel a sense of partnership. And then probably there'll be a third person who says, no, 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 no. The problem with this organization is there's some really good people and we should pay them more. And there's some really crap people and we should get rid of them. Right. Or, or something, they'll probably dress it up a bit, but that's what they really mean, you know, yeah? 
And there's going to be a fourth person, by the way, who doesn't listen to anything. It's all bollocks, goes back to their husband in the evening and says, I've just had another day of this crap. So, you know, that's the fatalism thing, which is always there, which I'd love to talk about more, asking about it in questions. Anyway. So, so in my book, my unpublished book, I am, as I said, open to office. Um, I, I, I give this bit of the theory a, a really inelegant name. I call it co coordination theory. You can see why nobody wanted to publish the book, can't you? Um, I, I was trained as a sociologist. Uh, and if you're trained as a sociologist, what part of being, is anyone else a sociologist here? If you're trained as a sociologist, you're trained to use the most abstract language you can possibly use. There's a, there's a joke which is told, which is, uh, what do you get when you cross a sociologist, a member of the mafia? And the answer is someone who makes you an offer you can't understand. Um, <laughs> so I, I use this term co coordination theory to, 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 to capture the fact that, that these three drives that I've talked about can be understood as theories about how it is we do things together, how we coordinate human activity. And if you start to look at it through that lens, you can also see, of course, that they underpin a lot of ideology. You know, uh, individualism, Thatcherism, there's individualistic left, there's left notions of individualism and right notions of individualism, you know, authoritarianism. In many ways, populism is, is a, a very kind of strong solidaristic expression. Um, it, it's, it's about what matters is tribe, what matters is belonging. What matters is us versus them. So you can hear this in politics. You can hear it in board meetings arguing about what to do in the organization. You can hear it in politicians and special advisors discussing what policy they should develop. But what do I think we should do with this theory? Well, here comes the kind of core proposition. So my core proposition is that you are most likely to successfully achieve change, you're most likely to be a dynamic organization, you're most likely to have a successful policy. If you both combine and align these three core human motivations. And when you think about it, it's absolute common sense. If all of you every day are driven sometimes by authority, driven sometimes by your sense of what is right to do, and driven sometimes by what you want, why would you want to have a workplace where one of those drives didn't exist, where you weren't motivated by that. And in fact, of course, in lots of dysfunctional workplaces, that's exactly how it feels. It feels as though what you want is not compatible with what you're being told to do, or what you're being told to do is not compatible with what you think is the right thing to do. So there we are. I could stop there. Very simple, positive account that says, if we want dynamic organizations, effective policies, and I could give you legion examples of this in practice. I don't have time to ask me again in questions of, of, of policies that, that fit this, that work in this way, organizations that work in this way. Well, there we are. Now, it's a bit more complicated. And it's a bit more complicated for a couple of reasons. But again, they're pretty straightforward. They're pretty obvious when you think about them, but worth me expanding on. So the first is that each of these drives that I've described, and this is obvious, isn't it? They all have good and bad sides to them. So, you know, hierarchy can be a really positive force for good, you know, effective leadership, effective strategy, but also hierarchies can be self-serving, they can be bureaucratic, they can be burdensome, they can be oppressive. Solidarity, that belonging motive, you know, that belonging motivation. I talk to people on the left and they say, oh, yeah, that's ours, that's ours, we're the solidaristic people. I say, well, no, but... You know, Donald Trump is very, you know, that's his story. Brexit was all about our tribe versus other tribes. So it, it too, you know, it's about what we share, but it's equally about what we share and what they don't share. So it's a drive that, it's a drive that also is a kind of benign and less benign side in individualism. I don't need to go on. You know, individualism is dynamic and agile and entrepreneurial and creative, but it can also be atomistic, selfish, shallow. And fatalism, good old fatalism, just going to mention it again, sometimes fatalism is actually a, a deeply thoughtful, considered and wise position, and sometimes it's just apathy and misery. So that's the first thing. Each of these forces that's at play in an organization can be turned, in a sense, to a kind of positive mode, but it can also have negative sides to it. But it, it goes further than that, because this is a dynamic theory. Because what I would argue is that actually each of these ways of thinking about the world derives its energy in part from its critique of the other ways of thinking about the world. 
you know, why do we need a strong leader? Because we've got to constrain people's individualism because it'll run amok. Or we've got to do something about the fact that people's solidaristic motivations mean that they aren't willing to be, to, 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 to do what we want them to do. Um, people who have conversations about what we share together are very critical of individualism and its selfishness, very critical often of people in authority and their self-interestedness. So not only do these forces have good and bad sides, but they're always kind of pushing at each other in, 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 in every organizational setting. They're, they're different ways of doing things and they're, they will always have different champions and they're always pushing against each other and they derive their energy in some ways from each other. And I give, I'm gonna give you a, a kind of crazy example of this. One example of this, it's years and years ago. I was at Vauxhall tube station in the rain. Um, it was a daylight today. And there was something wrong with the tube trains. So we were queuing up in the rain. And, um, and we were queuing up on one side of a kind of, of, of a hallway with a, with, a, with a barrier along the middle. Um, now this was a queue that was characterized by two of these human motivations. It was characterized by authority and fatalism. We were queuing up because we were told to, and we were queuing up because the bloody tube doesn't work and nothing works and the country's falling apart. Then a few people, now I don't know whether they were kind of sociopaths or they just had a really important appointment or whatever it was, but they started ducking under the barrier and going up the exit, <coughs> going up the exit to the ticket hall. And at this point, there was a murmur because we changed our nature in the queue. We were no longer just queuing because we were told to. We were now queuing because we were the kind of people who queued versus these terrible, selfish, individualistic people. So this expression of individualism led us to a, a, an upsurge in our kind of solidaristic feeling. And you see that in organizations. This is why, for example, things like performance-related pay, oh, that seems to work, but does it work? What does the effect it has on people's sense of togetherness? So I want to now turn to um, some kind of concrete examples of this theory in practice. Um, so I, I hope, it, am I, are you staying with me by the way? Is this, is it kind of okay the way that I'm building this? Very good, all right. I'm just gonna have another sip of fizzy water. Um, so if my proposal is that the most successful organizations and policies systems and societies indeed are the ones which are managed to achieve a kind of dynamic balance between these different motivations and the kind of methods and ideas that underpin them if i'm right about that and if i'm also right that it's actually very difficult to do then there will be lots and lots of ways in which things go wrong and indeed there are um, so sometimes what you see is what i call monocultures so sometimes what you see is you see organizational cultures where one way of doing things is dominant. And where you see that, what happens is sooner or later, it collapses. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Eastern Europe before the fall, the, 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 the fall of the Berlin Wall. These were societies that were wholly hierarchical. I mean, you can forget all the you know, kind of propaganda about about socialism, these were fundamentally one-party states where every single part of your life was controlled by people in authority. And of course, eventually we see what happens to those societies. They lose dynamism, they become corrupt, and also interestingly, they become deeply fatalistic. So when you have monocultures, you have a dominant culture, but you also have a profound sense of fatalism. So that's one example. But let's take a completely different example Communes. I've, I've read books on the history of communes. Communes, they ought to work. What a great idea. No. Nope. Generally speaking, communes collapse. Um, and they collapse for one of two reasons. They collapse because someone emerges as a leader and they turn into cults. Uh, or after a while, people get a bit bored with it and they kind of wander off. Yeah, because it turns out that a monoculture that's entirely based upon sharing everything and being involved in all conversations together, it ends up you know, it, it, doesn't, it, it, it becomes onerous, it's non, not very dynamic. Or take a completely different example, I would argue, which, was, which would be banks before the credit crunch. Now these were, I, these were individualistic monocultures. Now these were cultures in which the people in charge didn't really know what was going on. They were just contexts in which people were allowed to pursue the accretion of as much money and power as they possibly could. 
and we all know where that story ended as well. But interestingly, if you read the accounts of people working in investment banks and stuff before the credit crunch, there's also a lot of fatalism. They all knew it was going to go wrong eventually. You know, as one of them said, you know, as long as the music's playing, I'll keep dancing, but the music's going to stop. So this was a culture which was entirely individualistic, but also people kind of knew it wasn't going to work. So you get those extreme examples of cultures dominated by one way of thinking, one way of imagining, one way of imagining change, models which only really prize one set of ways in which we're human and not others. But much more common is what I call deficit cultures. Now, deficit cultures are where two of our core motivations and the systems and methods that go with them are articulated, but one is underexpressed. So the public sector, I've worked most of my life in the public sector or with the public sector, I'm doing it again now. W what is the public sector's deficit? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? The public sector's bloody good at hierarchy. I mean, really. You know, I think there are more kind of tiers between the head of a social service department and a social care assistant than there are between the Pope and a priest. You know, it's an inc incredibly kind of bureaucratic and hierarchical system. But it's also positive, very solidaristic. You know, people have a strong sense, you know, NHS people really, really care about what they do. The thing that upsets NHS people more than anything else. You know, they might go on strike about their pay, but the thing that really upsets people in the NHS right now is that they can't provide the level of care that they want to provide, because that's why they came into those jobs. So the public sector, good at hierarchy, good at belonging, solidarity, not very good individualism. And so for years, in fact, if you go right the way back to the beginning of the public services in the 19th century, Jeremy Bentham wrote a critique of public services in which he said the problem of public services, which hardly even existed, is they're not entrepreneurially enough, they're not risk-taking. And so, and we've had a hundred years of this, and every few years, there's an attempt to bring individualistic verve and drive into public services. And so we have that most recently with something called new public management. So new public management was a global movement, billions and billions of dollars and pounds and sp were spent on this. Management consultants had an absolute field day bringing individualistic methods into public services. You know, provider purchaser splits, uh, performance related pay, league tables, super salaries for the most, all of this stuff. It, you know, it, it dominated. I mean, really, for 20 years, that was the only action when it came to public service reform, was how can we bring market methods, because this is a problem with public services, they're not dynamic enough. It failed. It failed completely. No sign that it improved productivity. It cost an enormous amount of money. It pissed off, and did not excuse my language, an awful lot of public service workers and didn't achieve much. The reason for this is that you can't simply go into a culture that lacks a drive and insert it. It has implications. If you want public services more individualistic, you're gonna to have to let go of a bit of the equity. You're gonna to have to damp down the hierarchy. So what we had around the world was politicians who said, I want market dynamism in public services, but I still want to control every single thing they do. Well, not surprisingly, it doesn't work. Private sector, the traditional private sector, traditional shareholder model, private ownership model, well, it's pretty good at hierarchy as well. And if you work in private companies, you can, you can testify to that. And it's pretty good at individualism. You know, it's pretty good at things like, you know, rewarding people for their pay and, uh, you know, promoting people, encouraging entrepreneurialism. What the private sector isn't very good at <coughs> is the values and belonging piece. And they know it which is why they never stop banging on about it. You know, um, there, you, there's a bank. There's a bank that's close to here, and uh, it's so obsessed with showing you that it really is driven by values that it had its values in huge glass letters in its kind of atrium, which did lead people to say, the thing about this bank is you can see right through its values. Um, <laughs> so, and, and it's, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to sound cynical, but most of it is complete hogwash. Actually, these are companies that are animated by shareholder value, by maximizing um, a profit and market share. And, and yeah, they'll do a few nice things, but that ultimately, that's really not what it's about. And if you want, I'll give you a bit of evidence for this. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a session with HR managers of some of our largest companies. And I said to them, because it was very fashionable at the time, have you had a conversation about purpose? Oh, yeah, no, we had a conversation about purpose, all of us. Yeah, yeah, we had a conversation. Great. 
So I said, tell me, what dilemmas did that throw up? What? So what, you know, when you had a conversation about purpose, given that you're a company that has to maximize shareholder value and market share, what were the dilemmas about how you were a good company, given that you had, oh, we didn't really have any dilemmas. I said, well, I don't know what you were talking about, but it wasn't purpose. It couldn't have been. Because if you really want to be a company that does good, but at the same time is successful, it's going to throw up difficult issues. You, to become a B Corp, there must have been difficult conversations, right? So deficit cultures are those cultures which miss something and, and are constantly trying to strive to get it because they know they haven't got it. So businesses are constantly trying to say to their workers and their customers, no, we really care about you most, not just the shareholders and our own executive salaries. And the public sector, every few years, someone's going to come along, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, whoever it is, and say, we need to insert a bit of kind of market uh, discipline, a bit of individualistic drive. And it's very, very hard to do. Not impossible to do, but it's very hard to do. It involves really quite deep cultural change, which takes a long time, and people are generally impatient about doing that. So that's kind of my theory, uh, based, as I say, on years and years of reading, working with organizations, observing people, and thinking in particular about why policies fail. And if you ask me in questions, I'll give you a couple of examples of policies that have succeeded. And I think they've succeeded because they fit my, my model of, of using all of these different ways of driving change and holding them in reasonable balance. But what that does is it, it, it brings me to my conclusion. Because I think that my argument makes the case for employee ownership. Because I think my argument suggests that actually companies with employee ownership are organizations which have a better balance of the ingredients that I've described. They have the capacity to have effective hierarchy, effective leadership and management, a sense of shared purpose and belonging, but also to be organizations which people feel are good for them as individuals, which give them opportunities to earn a decent salary and to advance and to uh, progress themselves. So, my uh, argument would be that unlike a traditional privately owned or shareholder owned company, employee ownership doesn't have to suffer from that kind of deficit. It has all the ingredients there. But, but having the ingredients in the kitchen doesn't mean that the recipe is going to be right. So the second thing I want to say is that whilst I think my argument gives grounds for believing that employee ownership and understanding why employee ownership has got such a great record in terms of dynamism and in terms of uh, worker well-being, it also explains why employee ownership isn't um, enough. Because even employee-owned firms face those same issues. And I think sometimes the danger is that because you're an employee-owned organization, you can become complacent about the fact that you have to do the hard work of making organizations work. But you know, surely this is going to be work. You know, we don't have the problems that the public sector has. We don't have the problems. That we are all in this together. But you will still have those problems um, because you will need hierarchy in those uh, organizations. But you'll need to make sure that you don't become so hierarchical that it stops, to, stops feeling like you are employee-owned. It just starts to feel like a very conventional company. You'll need and value that sense of belonging that you get with employee ownership. But as Robert himself found out, if you become an organization that spends its entire time in a kind of rolling democratic conversation and doesn't really think that management matters, you're going to end up in difficulty because actually you do need that. And, and yes, you also need to be an organization where individuals feel that they can succeed in that organization. But you also will always need to balance the question, what's in it for me, with the question, uh, what's in it um, for us? So even in fantastic employee-owned companies, you are always going to have, just as in our individual psyche, we are dealing with different voices pulling us in different ways. In those companies, you're always going to have a, a dynamic situation and the danger of the organization losing that kind of balance, becoming too hierarchical, becoming too inward-looking and perfectionist about its its kind of democratic basis, becoming too uh, individualistic. And just a little final point, part of the reason for this, 
Part of the reason you've always got to be vigilant when you run an organization, it doesn't matter what the model is, you've always got to be vigilant about what can go wrong, is that actually circumstances change things. So, you know, one of the reasons we have boom and bust in finance is that when the market is booming, everyone listens to the individualists. But when the market is going the other way, everyone listens to the fatalists or hierarchists. Because and so you, it's, it's not, you know, and it, it's, I've seen this with technology. You know, technology at one time seemed to favor hierarchies, and then it seemed to favor the kind of individualism. And now it's hierarchies trying to grip it again. So one of the reasons why, if you're an organizational leader, it's always difficult to maintain this dynamic balance is that conditions outside your organization, competition, the state of the market, technology, all of these things can, can tilt the balance and you have to continuously uh, get it right. So let me uh, conclude. Um, uh, the kind of ideas that I've uh, articulated uh, today, um, in some ways, I think they're unfashionable. Uh, and they're unfashionable because they're based on a way of looking at the world, uh, which is about what we have in common. What I've tried to argue with you today is I've argued uh, about a set of things which is in all of us. So, you know, we're all more or less individualistic, solidaristic, hierarchical, different points of, my, of, of our lives. I'm, I'm kind of anti-hierarchical um, sometimes, but then at work, I'm the boss. So, you know, I tend to view things through that kind of, that lens. I'm, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm generally not fatalistic, but then I support West Bromwich Albion. So uh, I have a kind of place where I can take all that kind of gloominess. So we're all these things at different times and, and different, uh, different places, but we all have that in common. And it's a bit unfashionable, isn't it, to have a set of ideas which start from what we have uh, in, in common. But they're also, these ideas, pragmatic. Um, they, they suggest that the task is not to choose between the state or the market. It's not to choose between authority or belonging or freedom, but it is actually to balance and align uh, the different ways in which we're human uh, and the different ways in which we can get the best out of ourselves. And also these ideas are also unfashionable because they're optimistic. They're optimistic about the possibility of progress. And indeed, I'd argue that when we have made the fastest progress, it has been when we have managed to get this balance. I would say, for example, what the French called les trente glorieuses, the 30 years after the Second World War, when we became richer and fairer, and, and broadly speaking, governments seemed to work pretty well. It was a great, it was a period when actually all of these things worked. There were a time when with solidarity was strong in society in the wake of the war, but it was a, it was a period of a growth of individualism but also a time when governments were trusted, broadly speaking, not to go too far, but they were broadly speaking trusted to get that kind of balance right. And we, we found it incredibly difficult to get back uh, to that. Um, and then, but finally, 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 I want to say that I think these ideas, I'd like to imagine these ideas might have appealed to Robert Oakeshott because he, he was a man who it seems to me, having read that wonderful biography, he combined optimism and idealism with political moderation. Um, uh, he was an eclectic person. He had a remarkably different friendship circles and he had an appreciation of the value of every person that he met. Um, and that's what came out from that book uh, to me. Um, and of course, his instinct, his belief was that we can build organizations which enable people to fully thrive. So I guess that I think that by understanding and appreciating who we are, who you are, uh, about thinking about what gets the best out of us, that, that even in these, you know, dark times, um, that um, if we can commit to creating not just organizations, but places and societies um, that can both get the best out of us, but also enable the best flourishing of us. That that is the kind of goal that we ought to be putting once more at the front of our minds. Thank you.
Wow, how do you follow that? Um, Matthew, thank you very, very much. As I said at the beginning, we have a few minutes now for a QA, and a and I'm, I don't intend to abuse chair privilege, but I, I, I would love to, to maybe get us started if that's all right. Um, some people have described um, some of the tensions you've just explored to me from leading in an employee-owned business, trying to understand what they're tackling in terms of how, how do they build the solidarity, but also create that individualism and create that entrepreneurship, that internal entrepreneurship. And some of our, our members talk about how they've reversed into employee ownership, where some of these things are all actually there and the, the, the balance seems quite, quite well established. But there are those employee-owned businesses that have transitioned where actually they're incredibly hierarchical. And there's the intent to become perhaps more solidarity and, and, and those sorts of things, but that's a real tension. And so I guess my first question might be, where do we start when in, in that instance? In, in you just described it where the deficit cultures exist. It, what are the mechanisms or maybe some of the practical policies or examples that you've seen that enable us to turn the volume up on areas where there, there's a deficit? Yeah, um, well, so I think first, and this is the reason that I gave the speech and have been talking about these ideas for many, many years, is I think, first of all, just understanding who we are and understanding the ways in which we motivate people and the ways in which we can drive organizations is a really good start. But I think most people don't start with that awareness, actually. I don't think they, they think explicitly about the fact that organizations are a balance of these different things. And if you you know, that people think that if you dial up the individualism, it's not going to have an effect on people's sense of belonging or their trust in authority. And it doesn't. These, you know, when when we brought new public management into public services, it did end up making people feel that public services were not to be trusted, that they weren't about um, equity and inclusion, that they were driven by the profit motive. And there was a back down. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I think we, we do need to think about how we bring more entrepreneurialism and innovation and agility into public services, but we have to do it in a particular way that respects what it is that we're dealing with. So I think first, awareness. I think secondly, although it sounds prosaic, actually just asking how your staff feel is really important. And one of the things that's interesting is if you look at the most widely used surveys of staff, satisfaction, engagement, investors in people, or top top, top 200 companies or whatever. Um, if you look at the questions they ask, they're pretty much aligned around these things. So the sets of questions are, do you respect you know, the leadership and the authority? Just do things work? Yeah. You know, Because by the way, authority is not just about you know, charismatic leadership, it's just about does the bloody computer system work? You know? So all, you know, does do things work? Then about teamwork, you know, do you feel you're part of a team? That's one of the most important, you look at good work, one of the most important things about people saying about their work is they feel they're part of a team and also they're an organization that feels fair, yeah? But then finally, another element of work satisfaction is do you feel that you can grow, that you can develop, that you can learn, that you're getting fair pay, that you've got work-life balance? So the second thing is ask your staff how they feel and you might notice that people say, well, this organization's pretty well run, I get work very well paid, but you know, it's not fair. It's not fair. And if that is true, then you're not using this really strong human motivation. People are not coming to work and articulating their values drive. They're actually going to work and feeling that their values drive is, is, is infringed by their working experience. And they're venturing that they'll store, at the very least, it makes them less productive and ultimately it stores up trouble. So that's the second thing I think you need to do is to, is, is to engage and find out how staff uh, feel about it. And, and then I think finally, you just need to talk about it. You know, you, you need to, this is why I was so dismayed when that group of HR managers said there weren't any dilemmas in thinking about purpose. You need to have an open conversation with people and you need to see to, say to people, okay, if, you know, the staff, if you, if colleagues, if you feel that we need to strengthen incentives, how do we do that in a way that doesn't lead us to, 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 to start to feel that we've become an unfair organization? Have that. People are intelligent, people are grown up. You know, too often managers think people are stupid and they've got to do things to them because they can't be trusted. But actually, if you're having a really open conversation with people and you say, how do we get this right? You'll get a really intelligent response. That is an experience, I think, that we probably we hear more of in this sector and, and, and aligned sectors than probably elsewhere. Um, I'd love to see if our audience have any questions. There are 
Um, with Campbell's hand shot straight up there, um, there's a microphone coming round. Graham um, and gentlemen there with glasses. We'll start with those three, if that's right. Would you prefer three? It you know, depends, depends what the question is. Campbell, kick us off. <laughs> so, uh, look, Matthew, thank you. Um, just really, really thoughtful, as always. My name's Campbell McDonald, by the way. I, I run a little think tank that the sector has. It's been trying to produce some research to kind of evidence the, the impacts and some of that you referred to. Um, and I, I wasn't actually going to ask a question, so apologies, but one thing struck me really powerfully when you were speaking, and I just thought I'd share it, and you, you may have an observation on it. The vast growth in employee-owned businesses in the last 10 years has come from the introduction of this employee-owned trust model. And it means that you know, every time this happens, we create a group of trustees. And actually, Robert Oakshot is credited with um, suggesting a way that you bring the composition of a trustee group together. It's called the paritarian principle. And it just struck me that mm. potentially it's a very powerful fit mm. with what you just described. So if you would allow a little license, if an employee trustee is bringing something of that voice of the how the individual feels as a member of the company, the management trustee is bringing something of that case for hierarchy mm. and is authority doing what it's supposed to do. Quite often, the founder becomes a trustee for a period. And in a way, they're the embodiment mm. of that tribe. They created this tribe in a lot of instances. They built it. And then there's an independent trustee who in a way, might take over ultimately from being that solidarity, but is also, to use your language, the coordinator. Mm. They're trying to kind of encourage the balance of those views in the way in which the company moves forward. I, I just love the elegance of the argument that you made. I, I just thought it was absolutely wonderful, so thank you. Yeah, and, you know, I, as someone who has worked with good boards and bad boards in a range of organisations, it is a hugely important variable. And having a balanced board and having a group of people who deeply understand the culture of an organization, the, the boards that I've suffered most from have been ones that have been made up by people who didn't really understand the organization enough. They didn't understand its day-to-day -day culture. They, they thought you could just do things to it without it having consequences. And that's when things go wrong. So that, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Campbell. Um, Graham. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Graham Dussall, partner at Phil Fisher. I wear a number of other hats. One of them is organising policymakers from around the world to promote employee ownership at a symposium in Oxford. And so being able to deliver good, effective policy is important. Um, there are uh, an incredible number of directions one could take what you have just described. Um, I wanted to assure you that there has been research on this very topic, uh, which has found um, that employee-owned companies score well when you look at moral DNA, when you look mm -hmm. at these factors that, that um, you have described, and that there is a correct balance in employee-owned companies between them all, in contrast to, for example, running a listed company. Um, the reference to employee trusts is a good one. Um, there are various models of employee ownership. Um, I'm not going to ask what your view is of worker cooperatives, uh, uh, given the comments you've had on uh, you know, one member, one vote, people taking a long time to discuss. Um, but it is important to appreciate that the research shows that you get the best out of employee-owned companies when employees, as well as sharing in financial success, um, feel they have an individual voice and a collective mm. voice. In other words, there's something in the organizational structure that means my manager's not listening to me just because I'm a great bloke. Um, it's because within this organization, employees have a voice. And as Campbell said, what strongest, what's the strongest way to do that? And, but have a, an employee ownership trust. So it's probably no surprise all the growth over the last 10 years has been through using the employee ownership trust. By way of background, I do have a question. Maybe this is part of your unwritten chapter. Um, those who've looked at this before have suggested that this dynamic uh, you've described of balancing all these factors is really a case of trying to bring somebody's real personality into the workplace. 
In other words, at home, they make decisions based on these factors. Mm -hmm and that a bad workplace stops you. Mm -hmm. It forces you to follow rules, uh, or it perhaps, as you say, forces you to be too individualistic. I just wondered if you make any observations on that. You know, are you really saying we're asking, we're asking an organization to allow people to behave basically with care and understanding that they would have at home in the workplace? Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, as you might expect from me, I, I'm going to give you a balanced answer to that in the sense that I, I'm a little bit nervous about the whole thing about bringing your whole self to work. I mean, there are bits of me I don't I don't think my workmate should have to see, to be honest. You know, um, uh, um, it's a bit like, do you remember, there was an episode of Star Trek, wonderful episode of Star Trek where Captain Kirk, you're too young, uh, there's a, a Captain Kirk is split into two Kirks and there's one who's really decisive. Uh, but also goes around molesting uh, the female members of staff. This is 1970s, I must say. And then there's the other Kirk, who's very gentle and benign, but incapable of making decisions. Um, and eventually Spock gets the two Kirks on the teleporter. And he says, you know, it's to Scotty, it's a million to one chance, but we'll try to beam them back together again. And they're beamed back together. And, and I remember Kirk, he comes stumbling off the, the, the platform and he says... The immortal line, he says, Spock, he says, I've seen parts of myself a man should never see. Um, so I think there are parts of yourself that you, you don't want to bring to work. I think it's a bit almost totalitarian, this argument, you've got to bring everything to work. No, I'll bring what I want to bring to work, and that's fine. But absolutely, if work does not align with who you are as a human being, if it requires you to completely shut off a part of who you are, or to offend a bit of who you are, then it is a disaster. And of course, you know, this is the thing that, 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 you know, during the credit crunch, for example, people are going into banks and behaving in the most appalling manner and then going home and being very reasonable members of the community. And that kind of dissonance eventually catches up with you. you know. Thank you. Um, we've got probably time for two or three more questions. There's just yeah. there, then Anne. Absolutely. Um, and we'll see where we get to if that's okay. Thanks, uh, David Alterman, the Nursery Research and Planning. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, just a quick question about generational effects and younger people entering the workforce. And there's a lot of discussion about are uh, people um, different because of mm. they're different or different because of the circumstance they've lived through or a combination of the two. But have you seen a difference in terms of the mix of those three mm. drivers? And do you have any observations about how that yeah. might impact the workplace? That's a really fascinating question. Um, uh, and I, I, yes, I think I have. Uh, and it goes back in a sense to the fact that these forces can be expressed in all sorts of different ways. Um, and so I think younger people tend to have a view of individualism, which is less to do purely with money making and career success and more to do with life satisfaction. So that would be one observation. I think a lot of people who work in professional services, uh, professional firms would say that the model which existed a few years ago, which was basically come here, work ludicrous hours and get bullied for 25 years, but then you become a partner and you can do it to everyone else. So that it is not, it, that's not really so attractive, is it, anymore? Right, no. So, but that, you know, so I think that has, that has, that has kind of uh, uh, changed. Also, I think that, there is a more democratic feel amongst people. Certainly, if you look at the health service, one of the observations that health service leaders make to me is that um, is, is that during COVID, people did what they were told to do because they had to, because there was a kind of sense of emergency. Before COVID, there was a kind of command and control kind of culture. When people came out of COVID, they were no longer willing to do things just because they were told to. They needed a stronger sense of why that was the right thing to do. And so leaders who might previously have felt they could just tell people now have to have much richer staff engagement than they had before. So it's not that people are unwilling to accept authority, but it has to be more. Um, there's a bigger legitimacy ask, I think, often for authority now that younger people expect. Than, than, than possibly other people did. So I think it's really, yeah, I think it is interesting. So I think, all, I don't think, I would not use the generalization that young people are less individualistic. I would say their individualism is different. Yeah. And I'm assuming that creates additional tensions and additional requirements for balance. 
within yeah, an it's, entity. It's, yeah. It, 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 it's how people can get things wrong because they, yeah. they say, well, actually, this is a company that needs more individualism. I'm going to have performance rates to pay. Well, that's not what they wanted. What they wanted was um, uh, a, more, a greater recognition of their of people's identity and their different ways of wanting to work yeah. and that kind of thing. So, so it, that you, you have to think hard about what is it when, you know, we've all got these drives, but they articulate themselves in different ways. Brilliant. And you've got the microphone. Hi, Anne Tyler, Ownership Hi, at Work. Um, Matthew, I'm delighted that you agreed to give this lecture. Um, it's an event which is so close to my heart. Um, you made a great summing up of Robert, those of us who knew him. You've captured the essence of him. Um, but Robert was above all, more than anything, a pragmatist mm. for whom no obstacle was too great. So bearing that in mind with your NHS Confed hat on, how can we convince the incoming government that employee ownership has a role to play in the National Health Service and drag us out of the fatalism that we're in danger of falling into. And I'm going to give you a starter for 10 by referencing Be Caring, which is a hugely successful employee-owned social care company. Thanks. OK, so I'll, I'll answer questions quickly just so that if there's, yeah. you get through a couple more. I think really two things, and they both begin with PNR, so pragmatism and productivity. So I would, re, at the moment, really focusing on productivity because I think there is a kind of productivity crisis. And if you want to talk to politicians, whether it's about the public sector or the private sector, you'll be saying to them, look, we can help you uh, with this productivity crisis that we have. And actually, employee ownership can generate greater productivity in the public sector and in the private sector. And then secondly, pragmatic, don't sound as though you're obsessive about one particular model, because if they think you're obsessive about one particular model, they will discount what you say. So you've got to go, look, we're open to all sorts of different models, but here's one that seems to be particularly effective. And there are ones that are similar to this. And why is it that this is effective? So don't seem like you're obsessed with, however strong the argument is for a particular model, you're not obsessed by that particular model. What you're interested in is the way in which this helps organizations to be more dynamic and more productive. And that I think will give you a good audience. And there are of course, various parts of the health service that are run by social enterprises of various kinds. And I think they do fantastic work. They're too often forgotten. Actually, I did an event this morning with our community trust leaders and had to be reminded once again that several community trusts are social enterprises. So they are important. And for what it's worth, my own organization, the Confed, the journey I've been on with them over the three years, or two and a half years I've been there, which will culminate next year, I think, in a kind of relaunch, is, is I've turned the Confederation from an advocacy organization into what I want to effect effectively be an improvement mutual. So what I will be relaunching the Confed as is an agent of improvement and change in the health service that is owned by its members, co-designed by its members, so that change is driven in that, in that solidaristic way, that peer to The problem with the health service is if you accept my model that the, both, the best organizations balance kind of top-down lateral and bottom-up drivers, the NHS is completely, you know, everyone spends all their time looking up. And a better NHS is one where the center does less and does it better more improvement and change is driven peer to peer through the culture of people learning from each other. So remarkable how little time NHS leaders spend in other people's organizations because they're so heads down, but also being more responsive to patients, to the public and to communities. So I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of this in my own organization. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to look for a colleague for a steer. How much longer do we have? Five, five more minutes. Brilliant. So we've got a couple of other questions. Uh, gentlemen there. Lady here. Thank you. Thank you. Kieran Seal. Um, I want to ask something about the NHS. I, I used to be a board secretary in PCT and, and CCGs. And it, it seems to me that people have said, as, as you said, competition doesn't work in NHS. Let's, let's get rid of it. Collaboration's the thing. But there doesn't seem to be any of the subtlety of conversation that you were saying mm -hmm. is that there are good things about competition and there are mm -hmm. difficult things or bad things about collaboration. And is there some way we can rich and make make richer that uh, discussion and that change rather than just simple changing from one thing to another? I completely agree. And actually, we're doing some work at the Confed, which is not published yet, um, on uh, provider uh, on on, on um, uh, payment models. And actually, we're doing that work on payment models to say, look, actually, there is a role 
for rewarding people for success, not individuals, but organizations, sometimes individuals. And that's important. You know, I, I think people on the left can sometimes think that any of them, any of those kind of motivations are, are venal and wrong. They're not. You know, we all have them as human beings. So actually, yes, I think there is a bit of a danger that we've, you know, moved out of the internal market and its excesses. And, and of course, there's a problem about that model when you've got no money, because one of the things about internal market is it's very dynamic, but it does require there to be surplus capacity. Markets, you know, don't work if there isn't that kind of... So, but I completely agree with you. And um, it would surprise some of the people who work with me and for me that, that I believe that. But I do think that, that public services have got to think very hard about entrepreneurialism and agility and recognize that, yes, sometimes competition, well-structured, effective competition can be an important part of success. Brilliant. So, you know, I'm still a bit right deep down. <laughs> He'll question. come back into fashion one day. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, over to you there. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk, um, uh, Matthew. I, I've been aware of different bits of the argument, I guess, but this is kind of bringing it together uh, uh, for me. So let's say all of it is true. Um, what problem would you most want to solve using this framework? Oh, uh, the problem of the British state. Um, <laughs> to be honest, start small. Um, so th there's quite a few of us, you know, I have a Labour background and Labour, I think, is almost is, is almost certain to win the next election. So I think it's legitimate, even though I run a charity, to say the one's focused on Labour at the moment. Um, th there is a conversation around about the degree to which an incoming Labour government will recognise that the Whitehall model is just broken, you know, and the, the, the danger of a group of ministers who've never run anything, most of them, well, it's not criticising them, that's just their background, going into government and pulling at levers for two years before anyone has the heart to tell them that these levers aren't really connected to anything at all. Um, you know, th that... So, so try, now, it, it's interesting, Labour has got this model of missions, of, of kind of working across government, which we strongly support in the conference in terms of health. We desperately need a joined-up approach to health not just in NHS policies. Really hard to do that. The evidence on that kind of mission-driven, joined-up government is it's really hard. And, and so uh, I would want to use this theory to be able to say to politicians, look, what you're trying to create here is an ecology of change. It's not that you have to drive the change yourself and be responsible for the change. You're trying to create an ecology of change. And you have a really important part of that as the hierarchy. But what are you going to do to mobilize people's sense of what's right? You know, and what are you going to do to unleash people's ambition? Because if you, if you can generate those forces as well, then you can really start. And the best policies, you see, have this characteristic, you know, that they, they work, they're well designed. So I'll give you, I know we're finishing there, but yeah. I'll give you two completely different examples. So the smoking, smoking ban, I think, is a, good, is a good example of a very successful policy. And it was successful because it was implemented at a time when people were ready for it. If it had been done years earlier, it would have led to all sorts of backlashes and everything. Um, and individualistically, bars and restaurants had kind of reconciled themselves to it. Well, actually, people didn't want to be in smoke-free places, so actually business wasn't opposed to it. But the critical thing also in the smoking thing was the evidence on passive smoking, because that changed the solidaristic argument, because it was no, the libertarian argument, so, well, if I want to smoke and kill myself, that's up to me, it broke down, because no, because of the impact that you're having on other people. So it was a policy that was well implemented, that actually business adapted to very effectively, people adapted to very effectively, and which had this really strong sense of being the right thing to do because it's not a smoker's right to damage other people's health. So that's a tiny example of a very successful policy that I was actually uh, a bit involved in. But I'll give you a completely different example, which is Bolsa Familia, which is Lula's uh, anti-poverty strategy in Brazil, which is, I think many people would say, one of the most successful anti-poverty strategies that we've seen in a, in a, in a kind of middle-income country. And how was it designed? Basically, the way Bolsa Familia worked was that uh, families were given uh, money, which they could spend in whatever way they wanted to, poorer families, but they had to send the children to school and try to get work. And the interesting thing about Bolsa Familia was that after about a year, it wasn't really working because actually the 
the, the, the requirements weren't being properly implemented. And so it lost legitimacy because people weren't sending their kids to school and they weren't looking for work. And so Lula reinforced that because he knew that to win consent in Brazil for giving money to poorer people, he needed people to feel this was fair. Fairness isn't always about social justice. It's often procedural fairness, rule-based fairness. But now this is fair. I don't mind these people getting more money, but I want to feel that they're having to give something back, the whole kind of rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. thing. And it was incredibly successful, but also it was clever because Brazil's state apparatus was pretty complex corruption. You needed a really simple policy. You didn't, you know, how do you make this policy, design this policy as simply as you possibly can. You just give cash transfers to the poorest people. So it worked on all those levels and it was a highly successful policy. I could give you lots of other examples. Most policies do not have this characteristic. Most policies do not answer the basic question of, will this policy work in a hierarchy? Is it well enough designed? Is it practical? Do people think it's fair? Is it legitimate? Do people think it's the right thing to do? And does it align with people's day-to-day -day incentives? Does it actually work in terms of the choices people want to make in their day-to-day -day lives? Most policies do not meet those basic criteria, which is why most policy fail. Brilliant, thank you. What a fantastic note to end on. I hope that answers your question. Matthew, thank you for giving your time so generously. Um, I hope the holiday from the NHS, the two day holiday, the intellectual <laughs> yes. holiday has been worthwhile. We, we, we greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to wrap up quickly with a little bit of an update on where we're up to at, at the EOA. Um, so uh, this is one of our this is one of our highlights of the year. So absolutely delivered on that. And we've got a bit of time now for another coffee. So if you can stay, please stay. But we've got other options and activities for you to engage with us. Um, so there's our learning offer, which continues to grow and expand for those of you uh, in employee-owned businesses or with new colleagues or who are new, newly EO or looking to refresh or maybe recalibrate the balance inside your EO. There's a rich uh, learning offer uh, coming from us. Equally, there's a lot more events, but there's a couple that I'd love to draw your attention to. Uh, the first being on the 25th of April, we've got some new things coming. We've got, we're quite excited to refresh the, and introduce the next chapter of the EOA. So it's an hour and a half of your time. Please join us. Um, join our chair, uh, who's sitting at the back there. Chris, you'll be joining us there, because uh, the event also integrates our AGM, so it's your chance to have a say in where we are heading. Um, beyond that, we've got EO Day, so there'll be the celebration, the chance for us to show that solidarity as a network, uh, to raise the profile of EO. And the theme for this year is proudly employee owned. So we're starting to see businesses adopt this badge at pace. This is wonderful. This is outward facing commitment to your employee ownership. Um, so there'll be hopefully a lot of noise and celebration on EO Day. And then before we know it, we'll be in November and we'll be back at the annual EOA conference but there's plenty to do and plenty of opportunities to engage with us in between then. So um, there's questions around fatalism that Matthew, I'm sure you're gonna get out there uh, on, on the coffee, but thanks again for sharing your time with us this afternoon. I hope you have safe and dry journeys home um, and we'll see you all very soon. Thanks very much.